My name is uh, Chairman Hernandez Gill. I'm uh, the co-founder and uh, member of the board of directors of Seed the Commons, uh, Mila Cayot. It's a organization based in San Francisco. And um, I'm going to try to not get in the way of the presentation. So let me know if there's, if you can't see. Um, so I'm going to be talking about milpas uh, and how they intersect and meet with white supremacy and imperialism here in North America. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about milpas, but milpa, you might know in Spanish what it means. It's usually a cornfield. It's actually a little bit more complex than that. And I'm going to start going off into it in a second. But where I really want to start is what we mean when we say agriculture. And it, agriculture depends a lot on each individual's culture and the place and time. For uh, most people of European descent, for most people that are deeply impacted by European culture, that usually means not just the cultivation of fields, cereals, vegetables, that sort of thing, but it, it, it also includes and is very intertwined with this idea of domesticated animals, particularly cattle. But what I also want to highlight is that um, that was a very different concept in North America and in generally in the Americas before the arrival of the Europeans. And I put there a picture of a chinampa uh, and the milpas. Uh, the majority of the agriculture in North America, the, the, the sole or the principal source of animal input was human labor. So it's important to remember there were no cows, no horses, no goats, no sheep, no uh, chickens uh, in, uh, before 1492 in the Americas. There was no metal. That means everything had to be done by hand um, with uh, wood, that sort of thing. But what's important to remember is that these held through the system, through the MIPA, uh, what in English you tend to think of as the three sisters, the corn, the beans, and the squash, that system held some of the most densely populated places on Earth at, at the arrival of the Europeans, right? Huge cities, cities bigger than anything that uh, people had in Europe, all based on plant-based food, on a, on a system that was essentially an agroecological agro system, very similar to uh, permaculture, and again, effectively no animal input beyond and human labor. There were also really complex systems that we're now just starting to understand. Things like silviculture that was very dominant here in, in the Bay Area and in Northern California where the acorn was the basis, right? Um, so it, the meat bug to me is a great example of agroecology and the application of ecology to the design and management of sustainable ecosystems, agroecosystems systems that were sustainable on the scale of tens of thousands of years. And, um, and ultimately, this is what it meant, that uh, the foundation of most native agriculture in North America was predominantly plant-based and dependent on, uh, on a very simple integrated system. There were exceptions, but that this was the dominant way both in Mesoamerica and a lot of parts of North America founded on on these systems. Now things are changing though. Imperialism comes, genocide, white supremacy in the European system was that was imposed by force throughout all of North America from the 1500s onwards. It's important to remember that in 1776 was when Europeans first arrived to what we now call the Bay Area, right? So it was a very, very recent system. I don't want to interrupt because I know you're in a role, but um, I want to be clear, are you saying they just weren't using animals in agriculture or they weren't eating animals either? So what I'm saying is that the systems of agriculture, what people used to think of as agriculture in the native languages, in the native thoughts, didn't include animals, domesticated animals. The only domesticated animal were the dogs that came with folks from Asia, right? They weren't being used until, uh, till, uh, uh, fields, that sort of thing, right? So. Excuse me? They, they were people, the animals were eaten, but they were a very small percentage of the diet. Everything was predominantly based on the three sisters throughout the, uh, North America. But again, you have to think of 1776, the Bay Area, there wasn't a single European, there wasn't a single uh, cow, a single horse. That started changing. And if you saw the map that I had at the beginning, Indian land, all of the North America, 
Grange and Ranch cattle area basically exploded within the course of a very, very short amount of time. Land was taken not only from the native animals, not only from the native people, but essentially used to, uh, for corporations, for ranchers, to make money. So this, is, this happens in the course of 100, 150 years throughout North America. And this is where we have, again, the genocide and the destruction of ecosystems of whole nations in, in a very, very quick and short amount of time. Um, we also have the, the, the foundation of settler colonialism, not only in the United States, not only in North America, but all the way down to the tip of South America. And, um, yeah, I'm not going to mention that. It's important to look at things like the Bureau of Land Management and the systems, how they all integrated into taking all of this land from native folks and native animals, and how it's still being used today to perpetuate the elimination of animals for ranchers, for cattle, for the benefit of very few people. And. I want to make it a little bit personal. Does anybody know who this person is? <laughs> so, Fox, um, I come from a small town in Mexico called uh, San Francisco de Rincón, San Francisco by the corner. It was founded in uh, 1607 as basically a Native American reservation. We were resettled from other parts of Mexico, forced to go over there to work for the ranchers. For uh, the better part of 300 years, we kept fighting to keep our land. And it was a losing battle, though, because our land kept give, being given to uh, settlers, essentially, from other parts of Mexico, from the United States, from Spain. Fox's grandfather, who became president of Mexico um, about 20 years ago, uh, he came to my town. Uh, his grandfather was given a large land grant and, and essentially create, took, the, took the fields, took the land that my folks had had for hundreds of years to have cows. <laughs> so, um, yeah, very frustrating situation. And, and we have a current crisis at the moment, right, that goes beyond those sort of situations. And I think I was just talking with a lot of folks about this, where we have corn, we have the, these millennial traditions that are in a very, very short amount of time, it, within my lifetime, have been completely eliminated. So it hasn't only been the settler uh, colonialism perpetuated through uh, grazing, through cattle, through uh, reorganizing our systems and our lands, but also things like GM corn coming in and basically destroying our uh, corn. So, and, and that, that's, that's, for me, it's, it's a very heartbreaking sort of situation to be in where uh, we're seeing these traditions again within the last 30 or 40 years completely eliminated. Uh, and it's, it's the last vestiges, in, in a way, of, of what has started since the, I would say, 1492, right? So I encourage you to think of it, to acknowledge and understand that the systems that are being perpetuated are very uh, different from what things used to be even a very short while ago. Of course, vegan farmers I'm here with too today, 
But um, what I found was that they really didn't have any visibility. So instead, what I've seen over the years uh, in being involved with food activism is that the food movement uh, defaults to models that include farm animals. And the promotion of animal agriculture, of course, the small scale sort, sort has greatly increased over the past few years. So anywhere you look, especially if you live in the Bay Area, uh, you'll probably agree with me. Anywhere you look, whether you're um, reading an article about how we need to move away from industrial agriculture, or maybe you're reading an article about how a new center for agroecology research opened, maybe you're taking a permaculture class, um, you're presented with imagery of farm animals as the face of sustainability. So in our culture, a cow and pasture, a few chickens near a barn, is shorthand for small-scale, traditional, sustainable food systems. Um, and I think that this comes from our heritage of Eurocentrism. Not only are these things given a lot of value uh, culturally, but beyond that, they're quite simply equated with anything that might be an alternative to industrial agriculture. So much so that um, in a place like the Bay Area, if even people who set out explicitly as their project to say, you know, I'm going to start a garden with native plants, maybe that's what they really want to do, um, even in those spaces, what's interesting is that often people will still have chickens or goats or honey. So there is a blind spot when it comes to the animal component. Um, and so these ubiquitous representations really drive the notion that the only way to do sustainability is to include farm animals. So a main message from grassroots movements has been that we need to have food systems based on agroecology. And I first read about agroecology about 20 years ago. I've been involved um, with various forms of activism and volunteering around food and farming. And so, of course, uh, I knew that most people who promote and practice agroecology include animals in their systems. However, for a long time, it didn't seem to me that there was any inherent reason that it had to be that way. Um, it seemed that, theoretically, you could very well practice agroecology without farm animals. And so, indeed, I took this uh, definition, because there are many definitions, um, from the website of Nicole Bosper. She has studied with Miguel Altieri. She farms in England. She teaches permaculture design courses. And here we have a fairly uh, generic definition, which is a statement of principles. And this statement of principles, as you see, could very well be applied both to systems with or without farm animals. But here's a different definition that I found um, recently. I was looking up and what we're seeing more and more is the inclusion of livestock in the core principles themselves. Not just as an example of how things might be done, but in the principles. So we've, we've been moving away from the inclusion of farm animals sort of just as a default that just happens to be there because we don't necessarily think of doing things otherwise, to something that has more and more uh, been explicitly stated to be necessary. Um, so, culturally, I think that this largely stems from your country, but in turn it reinforces it. So there's a positive feedback loop going on. Um, and because this representation is so ubiquitous, people increasingly think that the only way to do sustainability is to include animals. So what's been interesting for me, um, as somebody who has been researching veganics a bit and talking about it, um, it has been interesting to be uh, to interact with people to say that veganics wouldn't be possible, that you couldn't possibly grow food that way. There's a lot of that thinking. Um, and at the same time, because there's a lot of that thinking, when you advocate for doing things that way, or you talk about, I want to you know, buy some land and do things that way, people often interpret that as if you were advocating for using fossil fuels, or as if you were advocating for a food system controlled by Nintendo. So what I've seen over the past few years is the creation of a false dichotomy between these two things. Can I ask a question? Sure. <coughs> sure. So, um, Maybe it's actually better if we keep the question. Can we leave the questions for the end, I think? Sure. I want to make sure that all the speakers get time. Thank you. Um, so, okay, I took the picture on the left. It might not be super visible. I guess you can walk up and, and look 
much better. I'm not a great photographer. Uh, so for those of you who are not from the Bay Area, um, Marin and Sonoma County that are north of San Francisco have a large amount of organic ranches. And consumers here are just very, very into that. Um, and so the picture that I took on the left, I took it at Cowgirl Creamery at the Ferry Building in San Francisco. Um, and Cowgirl Creamery is a, uh, sorry, the Ferry Building in San Francisco is a place where uh, a lot of tourists come on weekends so that they can try local artisanal foods, um, partake in sort of the food culture. It's just very popular. And so Cowgirl Creamery sells artisanal cheeses. And um, again, in these pictures, you can see it says Saving Land Supporting Farmers. And they have a lot of these pictures at their uh, store, at the Ferry Building, that are very lovely. These very lovely pastoral images of where their milk comes from. On the right is a picture from uh, the website of Sprouts, which is a local organic dairy company. Um, they have, uh, uh, they source their milk in the exact same area. So these pictures are all taken in the same area. And these pictures, um, for consumers as well as for activists, hold a lot of intuitive appeal because we, most of us, um, maybe all of us, grew up with the idea of the old McDonald's farm. And so when we see these images, it clicks and it makes for very good marketing. But do these images tell the whole story of that region and the sustainability of these ranches? So in the very same area that these pictures are taken, um, Recently, there was a lawsuit that was filed against Point Reyes National Park by three local conservation groups because the park has been renewing permits for ranching without conducting the required environmental studies. And so the native tool elk in Point Reyes National Park have been dying off, and the conservationists who filed the lawsuit think that they've been dying off due to conflict with cattle. One of the ways uh, that this conflict arises is competition over water. Now, in the same way that history that Chema presented a bit allows us to understand, I think, uh, where we're coming from culturally and why we're so attracted to this particular landscape, I think history also helps us understand the ecological effects of this model and what's happening with the tour. So when Europeans brought ranching into new areas in California and Mexico, it had profound ecological effects. Um, they didn't just put some cows on a piece of land and that was that. European plants and animals spread throughout the continents to the detriment of native biodiversity. And many conservationists still today speak of cattle as an invasive species, even though we're also presented from a different uh, source the idea that cattle will heal the soil. So um, I'll just leave you to a second to read that. <coughs> And um, I've 
I've even taken a workshop with somebody who promotes holistic raising, and I've been finding a lot of the rhetoric to be very interesting. So one of the messages that comes up often is this idea of timelessness and universalism of grazing. So um, an example, I was taking a class in that um, we need to grow native species, we need to focus on native species, we need to do away with non-native species. So he was very uh, strong in that message. At the same time, the same person was saying, in Kentucky, uh, it's not good to grow corn because corn is a foreign species, um, but on the other hand, he was promoting the idea that we should do great. Now, that's quite simply not true. Corn was grown in Kentucky before colonization. It was not something that was limited to Mesoamerica. It was grown further up north. Uh, grazing was not something that happened in Kentucky before colonization. So you could very well make the case that certain models are better than others without it having anything to do with what's native or not. It's not obligatory that you would say we need native species. Um, so the instructor could have just said, I think that grazing animals is good and growing corn would not be good. Um, however, that case is not made transparently. Instead, there's a strong message of we need to do things the old way. We need to have the native species and go back to what we've always done while projecting the European model onto a past where it didn't exist. So timelessness and universalism. Um, so for me, what's really interesting there of messaging is that people, a lot of people have taken the language of colonization that is very, you know, also trendy. They've taken that language and they are using it to promote a model that was a main mechanism of colonization. So it's, it's a very strange thing to, to see. So the second message that is um, usually more explicit is that, yes, it would be ideal if we had large native herbivores who could fulfill certain necessary ecological functions. That would be great. Unfortunately, those large native herbivores have disappeared, and so our next best bet is cats. So um, I've heard that a lot, and while I've been hearing that, that these are just, just a few of the headlines that I've been seeing. All of these headlines are from 2017. So lands are painted as being barren, devoid of native wildlife that supposedly has already been killed off in the past and we can't do anything about it, when in fact they're being actively killed in the present. The reason that bison are killed in Yellowstone every year is because ranchers are afraid that bison will transmit the disease. So again, it's the same concept. So um, another idea that, that we often hear is uh, we need animals in our we cannot have healthy ecosystems without the animal component. And to that, I say, and I think everybody who promotes the animal says, yes, of course, that's true. Um, the problem with that message is that it implies that we need to commodify certain animals to have animals in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We don't need to commodify certain animals. And the idea that we do ties into this universality that is ascribed to their European model. So because the European model and ranching in particular is equated with tradition and with working with nature, there's the idea that veganic farmers, by not having those animals, are sort of working against nature and not, not maintaining ecosystems. So one of our projects at Seed the Commons has been to interview veganic farmers for a series of profiles that we are building. Uh, Mona here actually has been doing a lot of that, so if you want to speak with her later, um, she would be a good person to talk to. So in our interviews and in our interactions with vegan farmers, we've never met anyone who would say that they're trying to create systems without animals. Instead, what they want are systems that invite in many animals. A system that supports biodiversity instead of being tailored, tailored to commodifying one or two animals. So I think that um, George is going to speak more about that, how does it support biodiversity? Better. But another way that veganics can support biodiversity as 
well, is that it allows us to produce the same number of calories on less land, which can free up land for genuine habitat restoration and the creation of wildlife corridors. So what we want is for the food movement to really broaden its notion of what is possible so that we can have conversations that really go beyond current blind spots and cultural bias. We'd like more, more visibility and education around organic farming. And we've already started working towards those goals ourselves. So here's a field trip that we organized to Matt's farm in Salinas. So I'm going to let him start speaking now. Four years ago, in typical millennial fashion, a long series of Netflix documentary binges <laughs> set us down a path of research that convinced us that we needed to start a farm for ourselves. The goal was to develop a set of practices that would be both ethical and sustainable. While chicken tractors, holistic culture, or snail raising, and high-intensity quail egg production tempted us uh, along our path to discovering our identity, we ultimately happened upon ALBA. ALBA is the Agricultural Land Base Association, a small nonprofit in Salinas that trains people passionate enough about agriculture that they'd start their own farms. Through the 10-month course, we learned all of the basic, essential skills we would need to run a successful organic vegetable farming operation. What we learned covered a huge swath of topics, from crop planning and bookkeeping to tillage and plant nutrition. All of, the all of the information I did my best to take notes on and absorb, and the 10 months quickly expired. At the end of the technical training, some students were accepted into the farm incubator program to lease land and try their hand at starting their own farms. It was around this time, right before we signed our lease, that both my wife and myself decided to go vegan. And I actually put crowd gasps in my notes. Because I thought we were going to be in the main hall. And so I thought it'd be like a lot more like Joel Salatin, like far, you know, fan boys and fan girls. But I, I can tell some of you are vegan. So the decision was entirely based on the idea that it was the most sustainable diet we could have. However, mere, mom mere moments after making our minds up to change our diets, it dawned on us that all of our training leading up to that point had relied heavily on animal byproducts for fertility. There had been no discussion or mention of alternative sources of plant nutrition, only those most readily available to us. Blood meal, bone meal, feather meal, fish emulsion, and manure. Of course, none of this was foreign to me. My grandma, or as I call her, Amama, had brought gardening with her uh, when she and my grandfather came to America from India in the 1960s. It was through her that I learned how to grow plants. When, uh, when I, while I showed little interest in my childhood, something awoke in me in high school that made me want to start my own garden. So, Amama and I went to the local nursery, loaded up on compost and transplants, and I started my first garden. Amama was by no means an organic gardener, but many of her methods I used in our garden to this day. She had her own compost bin, weeded religiously, and grew a large variety of plant families. But she also used conventional herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers. 
of the many lessons that I would learn from OMA, some of these uh, would be lessons of uh, what not to do. Now, fast forward years later, and the garden I was growing while I was studying to be a farmer was entirely organic, pesticide-free, but by no measure began. Our house was surrounded by horse ranches, so free manure was everywhere for the taking. I had never heard of veganic gardening or agriculture, never heard an argument in its defense, never heard of it even as a vague concept. It wasn't until we were on the precipice of, of signing our lease that I started to think about veganic agriculture. The first step in our journey to discovering was, a tip, was in typical millennial fashion through Google. Google will tell you some interesting factoids about whatever you may be interested in, but when it came to learning about, uh, about more in-depth aspects to long-term, large-scale veganic production, there was little to glean. The internet told me several things. Veganic agriculture and gardening exists. People all over the world are currently practicing it. Some people use worm castings and consider it veganic, some people don't. Some, peop uh, some veganic farms are big, but most of them are small family farms. Unsatisfied with what I found out, <laughs> it's biodiversity. Uh, so, shit, now I lost my place. <laughs> this never happens to Trump. <laughs> right, yeah. You can't do this more. Right. <laughs> yeah, no. I will not go off script. Uh, so, um, un unsatisfied with what I found out, I deferred to an old get out of jail free card I sometimes use when I'm stumped and don't know in which direction to go. I asked someone smarter than me. One of my favorite speakers. Oh, yeah, it's a good part. <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> we grew that. It's tobacco. Uh, so, um, one of my favorite speakers during my time at Alba was a scientist with the USDA named Dr. Eric Brennan. Dr. Brennan spoke on the wonders of cover cropping, and I was instantly a fanboy. Some of the most interesting studies uh, are his two. Are some of his most interesting studies are his 2013 study titled, titled Agronomic Aspects of Strip Intercropping Lettuce with a Listen for Biological Control of Aphids. At the time, he hadn't published the papers yet, but when I reached out to him, he was working on fascinating studies such as cover crop frequency and compost effects on a legume rye cover crop during eight years of organic vegetables and cover cropping frequency is the main driver of soil microbial changes over six years of veganic vegetable production. My main concern with veganic agriculture was the soil microbes. I had read academic books on soil microbiology and understood about the essential role they played in the healthy life cycle of a plant. My worry was that the soil, that soil without manure in particular, would not have all the nutrients to support the bacteria and fungi necessary for food production. In particular, I was worried about the bacteria. So I sent an email message to Dr. Brennan, and his response was more than encouraging. Uh, he wrote, I'd, I'd not worry about the microbes. They are much more resilient than we often realize, especially when we add lots of organic matter to the soil. Additionally, I turned to an old standby, the book Teeming with Microbes. Not expecting confirmation, I was very surprised at how, for all the manure they talk about in the book, the authors took a positive spin on veganics. Quote, human and pet feces should not be composted because of the possibility that diseased organisms might survive even the high heat of the, uh, of the compost process. For the same reason, we personally dis discourage the time-worn practice of using other manures in compost. Who wants to wor be worried about E. coli? The book goes on to talk about the connection between tillage, manure, and bacteria supporting nitrogen-loving vegetables at the expense of soil structure and the equally, if not more important, soil fungi. So I had my answer. I had gathered enough evidence that organic agriculture was viable enough to take a shot at. Two years later, our plants are growing as well or better than our neighbor's plants. We've produced at a commercial level and have seen no negative effects to farming organically. 
animals don't appear to be necessary for growing healthy soils. So, to quote Dr. James McWilliams, we're killing animals for food that we do not need. My hope is that we build a, strong, a stronger network of information on veganics to help those that come after us. More attention needs to be given to the, develop, the developing practices that produce maximum health and prosperity for humanity while still maintain, maintaining unyielding mercy for animal kind. Thank you for your time. In 1980, I bought a lovely piece of land up in Cape Bay Valley. How many people know where Cape Bay Valley is? With my wife, and we were expecting, and um, we took a big risk. We um, were assured that the newly constructed Indian Valley Dam, which was not anything to honor Native Americans, being that it flooded some of their ancestral villages. We're assured that the purpose of the dam was to uh, provide flood protection for all of Yolo County. And, um, you know, look, looking at the, the slide here, if you notice all those almond trees just right of center, now we're going to look at it from, from a different angle. Because what we encountered in our first five years there in Cape Bay Valley, and we were one of the most successful organic farms to be serving the Bay Area at that time, was a series of high water events that literally destroyed our, our land. When was the dam built? Dam was built. Huh, it was completed just prior to the extreme drought of 1978, 79. So there was absolutely no water collected during that period after construction until the rains came back again. And the rains came back with force. So believe me, you know, the cycles that we're seeing now are not necessarily unprecedented. So that's before, OK, 30 minutes later. See that black walnut stump right there in the center? See it there? See all the garlic there? That was an herb garden. Vegetables. The almond trees were off to the left. And what we were left with after five years was basically about this much of the land. And our barn was right there, right along the edge of that. So we lost our land. And the reason I bring this up is because this is a direct result of two very serious problems. One, deforestation and disruption of the ecosystem and cattle grazing. So believe it or not, during the same period, I was having to 
wage a solo battle against CDF fire crews that were using napalm dropped by helicopters to burn off the chaparral on the hills there above Cape Bay Valley, just in order to make more room for those cattle to graze on the, those fragile hillsides. Mm -hmm. So I hope it's clear to everyone in this room just how incongruous that really truly is. And I actually took over a field uh, right near, right across the highway here, um, where they had spilled, they had intentionally dumped napalm from the, the tank and the helicopter because they had no better way to dispose of it. This is California Department of Forestry. And boy, they sure heard about it for me. And for a while, it seemed like that practice had changed. This one looks a little bit out of order, but um, in later years, I found myself up in, in uh, Humboldt County after life got resettled. And, and um, I began uh, my effort to save endangered seeds. And what you're looking at here is a newly tilled uh, area, a very harsh, I would say, class four soil, possibly worse, maybe class five if there is one. Um, I don't know if you can see the rocks there, extremely gravelly. These are test plots of, and, and regeneration plots of hullless barley. This is a barley that doesn't have the outside husk and on the grain that requires additional milling. So for um, low fertility soils where moisture is scarce, barley is a vastly superior crop to, to wheat. And there's a little garden plot inside with some strawberries and things underneath the dome structure that's actually just providing a little bit of deer protection. So we spent um, 10 years up on this site. It was a Native American heritage site, the home of this medicine people of the Karuk tribe. And witnessed, among other things, the renewal of some of the tribal traditions where they actually burned off. They started a fire right up there and burned off that, that little meadow. That you see, not really a meadow, but a brushy area up on top of the mountain. He's got all scrambled down, so I don't know how that happened. But anyhow, so in my quest to um, explore alternatives and save seeds and, and bring more of these seeds back into uh, common use, uh, I began to discover some very interesting plants uh, that were not natives but were sometimes confused with natives and that, that do have some, uh, some uh, adaptation to our area. How many people know what uh, plantain is? Do you recognize that as a plantain? This is the European plantain known as Star of the Earth, or there's a different name for that in every European language. It's really fascinating. I can show you in the historical book I have up on my table out there if you're really interested. Um, but it's a salad grade plantain, and I tested this on my children, my young children. Uh, who normally would not eat plantain in the middle of summer when the heat is you know, 100 degrees. But it's very palatable, and it's just another one of those ubiquitous crops that um, we as, as plant-based eaters need to be aware of because our uh, European uh, food plants are woefully lacking in minerals, and it doesn't necessarily depend on the soil that they're grown in or other conditions like that. It's just the plants just simply do not produce what some of these more ubiquitous or indigenous plants produce. So, um, you know, biological diversity also applies to our diets too. And there's so much more we can do to uh, reduce the harm of our modern agricultural system by um, 
learning to rely more on wild plants and naturalized plants. We can also help to stop the spread of invasive plants by finding uses for them in medicine, and nutrition, and other, and, you know, dyes and, and fiber arts, and, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So here I am at Stanford University, World Vegetarian Day, 1990, <laughs> along with John Jevons and uh, I think Alice Dean was a teenager, but she sure was rocking that show. How many people know Alice? <laughs> and I made often, more often appearances at UC Davis where, uh, among other things, I you know, proselytized the um, vegan culture and, and um, the use of native plants. Here's the um, cones from the, um, well, I'm going to use the, the uh, non-native terms. Uh, maybe, maybe someone else here knows <laughs> I would like to know what, what the native name, or how it's pronounced, actually. It's a very tricky word to try to pronounce. Uh, but the uh, digger pine, which is not a complementary term applied to Native Americans, uh, was slightly sweetened by changing it to the gray pine. Uh, which is, does not sound like a native <laughs> name to me, but um, incredible pine nuts that, that can last in, um, you know, in terms of like five to ten years on shell. What an incredible source of nutrition. So I really gained a tremendous amount of respect after moving up north, living there with the Karuk and the Hupa and the Yurok, and learning some of their traditions and appreciating their food plants, their medicine plants. In their friendship. So now we're going to jump back to the issue of, of biodiversity. What I want you to see here is from the book Garden Seed Inventory, sixth edition, 2004. Plant types that lost 25% or more since 1981. Okay, so that's 20, 23 years. Those numbers are just shocking. Look at the far right column, and you, you can see the range of losses of varieties. Of, these are cultivated vegetables, quite common, all, all, all of these categories. Um, the most, some of the most predominant, I'll let them see a lot of beans there. Uh, we have corn here, yeah, there's corn. But um, so since industrial agriculture, what we've witnessed is just a massive, massive uh, erosion of the genetic diversity that our uh, cultures, both Eastern and Western, all cultures have witnessed uh, since the onslaught of, um, of industrial agriculture. I really hope we have the follow up. Here we go. So, Looking at this through the lens of seed companies, the 400 seed companies in North America, and um, which is what this book uh, entails, is an inventory of all commercial seed offerings. So what you see down here in the bottom half is available from one source, two sources, three sources. So what we're looking at is as these seed companies go out of business, which is what you see up on top here, companies lost 50, minus 54 in three years, minus 41 in the next four years, minus 26 in the next three years. So it's not just the varieties. The reason why the variety is being lost is because the human effort is not being applied to maintain them. It takes enormous amount of work to maintain them. In theory, our government and our, our seed banks, we're going to be maintaining these things for our progeny and for the long term. But they have really been hijacked by the corporations. So it's our national uh, repository in Colorado has really been nothing more than cherry picked by corporations and they can patent those seeds and, and you know, then bring them into a much more profitable uh, paradigm. 
and contrast that to the abundance we find in nature. You know, the seed business paradigm is one of intentional scarcity, specialization, hybridization. Now we have genetically modified organisms. This is this is biopiracy. What we're looking at here is the offspring of one cabbage plant that was one of a number of plants in a row. I, how many know, of you know about population size required for seed saving? Many people don't know that corn requires to, to have a, a genetically stable population really an absolute minimum of 200 plants. So if you're growing a backyard patch of corn, that's got less plants than that. If you don't have some other source of pollen that's coming in to cross pollinate that corn, because these are outcrops because they depend upon them. They're not self self fertile. So anyway, the example I'm showing you here is just how much abundance nature creates when you allow plants to go to seed. And I think that's something you know with modern day gardening and what we're trained as, as you know, young people is don't ever let those plants flower. You know, that's just a waste of space. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of fertility. You don't want that to happen. You want to get, your, you know, get another crop in the ground as soon as you can, and so forth and so on. So I'm just, and then, you know, what I learned, and I'm sorry these are all scrambled, I have to get back to this, but how to do indigenous methods of, prop, of propagation where we simply dig up those, those transplants from the soil, bare root. Maybe it's a 100 degree day, maybe we have to wait till the evening. We lay a little, a little drip line down on the, on the soil, and the soil has incredible moisture just underneath the surface. It's river bar soil in the eastern part of Humboldt County. And uh, so rather than the, as opposed to uh, some of the more modern methods of planting in trays and you know going through all these elaborate procedures. This is a one-step process that gets your crop in the ground. And um, once in this type of soil, with that one good soak within a few days. So you can see this is a sequence of each each of those four rows was planted. So you can see how fast the plants on the right are growing compared to the ones on the left. I'm just talking about those four rows there. Um, the ones on the left being the most recent ones transplanted. And they might have been a day or two apart. You know, looks like the first two rows were planted, and then I think the next two rows were planted, maybe a day or two later. But you can see how quickly they just take off. This is. I'll get to that. Okay. Here's um, winter harvest with uh, turnips down the center, carrots on either side, or maybe that's cilantro on the right, hotel. Swiss chard to the right of that. Picture's a little fuzzy, maybe my memory too. Um, Looks like uh, possibly cauliflower to the left and some more uh, uh, chard to the left now. So being, uh, once I started tapping into this kind of abundance and having the seeds, which typically most farmers don't want to mess with, they would prefer to buy genetically uniform seeds so they can sell on the, on the larger markets. And, uh, tend to not appreciate minor variations, which can lead to some really surprising and, and awesome results. Like, for example, this quinoa plant that came up volunteer and produced 2.2 pounds of seed on a single plant. <laughs> so this, this relates back to that first slide showing the plant families and all that. This is, this is drilling down into diversity. A co-evolutionary co structure for the grass family. Okay, so I don't know how to zoom that. I don't think I can zoom it. But basically, 
we've got some of the wilder types up here, including the corn, the teosinte, um, some of the sedges, the sorghum, um, lemongrass. Here we have the millets, uh, various millets, because of course many you may not realize there's five different species and, and genera of millets uh, that are grown in, in many different nations and they're very uh, highly partition photosynthesis. The reason why this uh, was of interest to me is I had absolutely no training in botany whatsoever. No training in, in agroecology or biology past the ninth grade. And through collaboration with our fearless leader, Alan Kapuler, PhD, molecular biologist, who developed this uh, system using the most you know, cutting edge computers that were available in the early 80s. <laughs> um, and the bubble mapping uh, system there. So what the circles represent is the species, the number of species um, within that family or group of families. So through this bubble mapping, it gives you a, a kind of a horizontal view of the state of evolution. So in other words, each of those bubbles might be either shrinking or expanding through evolutionary time. You know, you might get more species differentiation or maybe the scientists are, are learning, you know, to reclassify. This is all based on what's known as APG, Angiosperm Phylogeny Group, which is an international con consortium of scientists who continually try to refine the scientific classifications of the plants. So as I said, they might be shrinking, they might be expanding, that may represent um, some extinction or some additional diversification that's, that's been identified. <laughs> this, is, this is the one I wanted, to, I wanted to finish up with. So, you know, what I was hearing this morning was from the speaker, he's kind of predominantly talking about um, animal agriculture. And one of the justifications there is, well, there's only one or two percent. I mean, the one per, no, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll say two percent because that sounds better. <laughs> but yeah, there's only two percent of our nation that are still farming. So um, we're very overworked, number one, and we're very under, you know, you know, under. Handed, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm not <laughs> Um, undermanned uh, in terms of you know providing all this food to feed the world, and um, you know I think we're dealing with a situation of life out of balance. And the, question, the existential question is: Are we going to strive to keep the system that is failing in balance, or are we going to? find some kind of real balance and allow more people to inhabit our lands. And we have vast amounts of public lands in this country, and you almost never hear people bringing this up in this time of unemployment, poverty, drug addiction, the, you know, the horrors of our modern civilization. You almost never hear this. And I just hope and pray I'm not taken out from even mentioning it. This has to do with um, the, um, my friend's seed collection that I'm just currently rescuing. One of the largest heirloom seed collections in the country. So here, what I'm trying to represent is some of the diversity of lagoons. And many of you are probably familiar with the common beans, the phaseola, phaseolas, that represent the top two rows there. But um, starting down here, how many people know what this is? 
Lupini, exactly. Uh, it's the edible seeded lupin. In recent years, they were adopted here in Yolo County, thanks to researchers at Davis, as an oil crop. And you know, there were many experiments made to try to, you know, prove that as a as a as a, a viable crop for California farmers and elsewhere um, to extract the oil and so forth. Peas, most people are common with. Um, this is Crotillaria, which is from Australia. That's a legume that's used as a green manure. This is Latherus sativus, which is a, 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 another species of the common sweet pea, the, uh, of which we have the wild sweet pea and the cultivated sweet peas. These are not uh, native crops. And then down the bottom row, we have four diff or five different varieties of um, carbonsas. And Again, I think the important thing to realize is that especially, you know, we all, I mean, there's a lot of love for vegetables. And when you look at seed savers, and I'm kind of just extemporizing here, but when you look at the trend of seed savers and how people love their tomatoes and they love their eggplants and they love their peppers, that's all fine and good. But we are losing the battle in terms of our grains, our seed crops, our legumes absolutely going down like you know, sinking like a stone. The diversity is not even being addressed. You don't even see seeds here with addressing that in the, in the, the chart in the garden seed industry. They're just not, they just dropped that. If we had a seed and grain exchange going on 30 years ago, so you know, farmers could co you know, collaboratively share uh, germplasm and, and resources. It's all gone and gone for, for quite a while. And, the, and Seed Savers has not updated Garden Seed Inventory for 13 years. <clears throat> Without Garden Seed Inventory, how am I pulling 500 to 1,000 varieties of these potentially uh, commercially extinct varieties to know which ones I need to regenerate in the next season? Which ones I'm going to expand? You know, uh, Expend immense amounts of effort to grow, maybe get three seeds to germinate from a thousand or, or something like that. So, here's my first um, real big garden up in Orleans. Um, this became the, um, the newly constructed Karoo um, Tribal Housing Project just a few years later. They really loved having the sunflowers and some of the other volunteer things coming up in their yards for a year or two. <laughs> um, so again, I have to apologize for things being out of line. But it, this it, is a real... Dinner, can, I, yeah. can I just say something? I just want to say dinner is served. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is the line is tremendously long already. Mm -hmm. So, uh, We're okay. <laughs> Sorry. We're, just, great. We're probably getting there. I cut now with the slide spread. That's like fascinating. That. I just coming in and catching the difference. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful, Mark. I'm glad. The ground you can. <laughs> so, um, anyhow, um, this is a very interesting project that just sprang up overnight through the reclamation of um, some very degraded industrial land. And it was not intended to feed the community, but it was intended to, to uh, produce seed. And uh, because really there were some pretty horrific industrial residues on, on the property right there. But it's just an example of how, um, through seed growing, you can do just incredible bioremediation. And now I'm just going to touch on the subject of um, companion planting, but it also relates to um, um, the other issue of wildlife uh, control. Because this is really a very important um, factor in my experience. And um, living in the wild up there with bears and elk and you know unknown creatures doing the kind of crazy things you know, <laughs> at various times, 24 hours a day. And uh, so what you see there is the watermelons down the middle of this aisle. There's um, uh, 
that's the hollowest barley off to the right, a larger uh, crop there. That's all ready, ready for harvest. And um, some, my intuition just told me, which is, I don't have enough watermelon seeds. I've got to get the most number of plants I can out of this little seed. How am I going to do this with my planter? Darn, I'll just take these old sinia seeds and mix them with the watermelon seeds. And just plant those two rows. And just see what happens. And if there's too many zinnias, I can, I can pull them out because if there's too many watermelons, I need to do that. I'm meeting, you know, make that happen. Well, the bears went around in circles and never mm. found a single man. Now, I don't know if that's because the zinnia smelled bad or, or what. But anyhow, on the left, a wonderful crop of sunflowers. What you can see there is. Um, whole beans climbing up on the sunflowers. So what we're creating is a seed crop of sunflowers that are then followed by the pole beans. So you get a double crop, a triple crop. In some cases, I'm going to show you another slide that's got even more parameters. And now we're skipping back to um, something that was once of interest to us, the organic pioneers. Um, how many of you know Don Weaver? Don Weaver. Don popularized the uh, the idea of soil remineralization. So what you're looking at here is a test plot on my farm in Cape Valley with different locally sourced rock powders applied at different rates. So I think there might have been five different materials um, for five different sources applied at different rates. So it, you know, as I learned from being in proximity to UC Davis, you do a checkerboard pattern, so you're kind of spreading it out over the landscape so there's any inconsistency in the soil. It will sort of offset that. And this was a very informal trial. We did not measure, you know, crop yields or anything. This is showing you right after we applied the, the rock dust. You just applied the rock dust um, yeah, I'm trying to think, did we just water it in? It's uh, a good question. Salad mix. And here's another way of growing the seedlings directly in the ground. And again, this is a way to get the strongest plants because what this is is like a miniature farm. You have row upon row of First, there'll be herbs, then there'll be cabbages and, and tomatoes, then there'll be lettuces, then there'll be amaranth, then there'll be more cabbages, then there'll be, you know, row upon row of different crops. The point of that being, that's a lot of seeds planted in a small area. That bed right there could have produced maybe 4,000 seedlings in an area that's smaller than the size of the so Sulika to, you know, the stage where we can put them out directly in the field. Questions? Soybeans, I've done a lot of research with soybeans. Max out at about 58 crops. Look at the colors, look at the diversity. How many of you have seen something other than a yellow soybean? Those are awesome. Yes. Absolutely magical. Plant diversity brown, black, yellow, green. Here we are doing a squash harvest and uh, seed selection with some my two children on the outer left and right, my two youngest children, and some other pioneers. Some of you may recognize the film um, to the center right there. Um, he came up from Sebastopol. Here's the other polyculture uh, picture I wanted to show you. So, what we have here is single rows that were planted with a mixture of, gray, of sorghum, basil, jute, 
also known as Jew's mallow, which is a, or, or melochia is the Egyptian name. And there were, what's that over there? Gosh, I can't remember what else was in there. I think there were two or three more, more species in there. But, um, you know, what we're needing to look at is ways to um, use polycultures more in order to create the beneficial habitat for insects. I was so happy with all you guys, like photos this were stunning. And, uh, and we're seeing this trend on, on a bigger scale you now, planting certain crops. The, the, the field is wide open for innovation. I really hope everyone gets that type of message. This is absolutely wide, wide open. And here, so uh, this goes with the salad mix in the bag there. And this is what I wound up doing up there. Whoops. That seems to be done now. I paused. Oh, amazing. Well, we must have gotten out of order. But what I wound up with up there was a ranging community supported agriculture project. Uh, not from that one field that had the issues with the, the um, you know, industrial pollution and that. And that. But this was my most recent field in Willow Creek. And uh, I was able to feed people just from the test plots that I was growing for the vegetable seeds that I was producing. So. <laughs> so things have been so scrambled, I probably could have touched on some of the other issues that my predecessors I want to thank you guys so much. That was so informative. I learned so much from your presentation. And I thank you all for hanging in for this long and, and uh, elaborate presentation. <laughs>